Bali in Amsterdam. Welcome to Shake the Food System. My name is Aldit Hunker. I'm probably the only global freestyle multimedia journalist in the world. My core business is moderating international events, debates, and talk shows. And I'm also a videographer and a media coach. It's my great pleasure to be your moderator today. Today's program is a co-production between the Bali and Dutch Research Council, NWO WOTRO. Together, we'll take a trip around the world in search of a more resilient food system. Why is this relevant, you might ask? Well, our global food system is under great pressure. The current COVID-19 crisis has once again made very clear that in our interdependent, globalized world, Unexpected shocks and the responses to them by people thousands of kilometers away have an impact on us all. One such impact is the effect on food supplies. Not only are we desperately trying to hold up against an acute crisis like COVID-19, but on a more long-term scale, we are also dealing with climate change. Our food system is simply too fragile. These crises show how dependent we are globally on the current food system. So how can we make it more resilient so that it can withstand these crises? Over the past six years, NWO WOTRO performed 75 studies. They are now coming to a synthesis. And the question is, what are the lessons we can learn? Well, based on those studies, we'll be discussing existing initiatives that we can take away from. For instance, East and West Africa and South and Southeast Asia are more experienced than the Western countries when it comes to shocks in the food system or the effects of climate change. How do they deal with their reality and how do they prepare for the future? What can we in the Netherlands learn from elsewhere to improve our own re uh, resilience? There are many global initiatives to shake up the food system and to handle problems that we in the Netherlands will be facing soon. And this program is about learning from those initiatives. And who knows, we might even learn a thing or two about our own position in the world. In this program, we will focus on specific examples uh, out of those 75 studies. Uh, there will be two panel conversations. The first is about acute crisis and the effect on the food system. My guests will give us examples, inspiration, and critical thoughts on how we can diminish our dependence. The second panel is about long-term crisis. How can we set up our food system for the future? What can the Netherlands learn from initiatives in other countries? And who are the big shakers of the food system? Or who, are the Dutch, uh, who the Dutch government could push? We have an international Zoom wall that will re uh, react to both panels. They have been involved in the NWO research. And there will also be two presentations. At the end of the program, Jaap Tielbeke will speak about the responsibility that each individual has for the system. And we start the program with the senior policy advisor at NWO, Science for Global Development. She coordinates the food and business research program and has been involved from the very start. Please welcome Corinne Lamain. Thank you very much, Aldit. And thanks everyone for joining us tonight here in the Bali. Um, it is quite an exciting event for us, uh, bringing so many research findings to a wider audience in the Bali, so well known in the Netherlands. Um, so we thank the many thanks to the Bali for uh, being uh, so interested in the research uh, results and making this happen. Um, how to raise food and nutrition security for small-scale farmers and poor communities in low- and middle-income countries by increasing knowledge and innovations that can be used in practice. That was the starting question of food and business research, a research program that started in 2013. Around that time, the debate on food and nutrition security globally was rising, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs decided to make food and nutrition security one of their policy pillars. Around those policy pillars, knowledge platforms were set up, and they related to research programs. One of those knowledge platforms was food and business, and this uh, research program was related to the platform. 
It was launched by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and NWO together in um, a joint investment. Uh, and its aim was to support food and nutrition security at the local level in low and middle income countries and support more sustainable and inclusive global food systems. 75 research projects were funded uh, since 2014. They worked in 27 countries, you've just seen them pass by on the screen, uh, with a majority of projects indeed in East and West Africa, South and Southeast Asia, and a few projects also focusing on Latin America. 30 million euro was invested by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and NWO, and another nearly 10 million was added in co-funding in the research. 338 research partners have been working all those years on the projects. These were not only academics, they also collaborated with uh, partners from the field, as you may say. Uh, farmers' organizations, businesses, NGOs, governmental agencies, think tanks, and many more from the Netherlands, but also from the Global South in joint collaborations. Which re research topics were addressed by those projects in all those years? It was a very a wide range. I cannot cover all of them, but I will highlight some. Uh, a focus on improving food production as well as value chains was uh, the part of many projects. Improvement of crops and agricultural techniques to raise yields, uh, but also make them more resilient to, food uh, to climate change. Um, you may think of cassava, tomatoes, uh, sesame, many other commodities were part of these projects. But also focusing on agriculture uh, being more circular was part of many of the projects. They looked at closing loops, for instance, by reusing waste, um, using uh, insects as feed, um, but also looking at uh, uh, the recycling of waste um, and uh, using organic um, practices as fertilizers in aquaculture, for instance. There was also focus on inclusive business models. Is it even possible? How can they benefit uh, marginalized farmers and uh, marginalized communities? And other economic aspects were also focused on. Access to markets, access to finance for small-scale farmers in the Global South. And the social side, obviously, was also part of all the research projects. Uh, we have a number of uh, projects also presented here today, focusing, for instance, on women food entrepreneurs in uh, Kenya and Burkina Faso, uh, focusing on entrepreneurial behavior of farmers in Malawi and Zimbabwe, but also focusing on researchers co-creating knowledge with small-scale farmers. These are just a few examples of 75 research projects that I would really like to actually introduce to all of you because each of them merits your attention. But since we do not have the time right now, I invite you to have a look at that online. A very defining feature of the program was also uh, its setup, the collaboration between academics uh, with partners from society. Um, farmer organizations I already mentioned, NGOs, businesses, extension services. Um, these partners were all part and parcel of the research projects, from the very start, defining the research question, throughout research execution, until the moment where the research results are available and made um, uh, available in ways that can be used in practice. This was um, a key element of the program, this knowledge co-creation, as we refer to it. Um, and it was, at the time of the start of the program, fairly new. By now, we see it much more common in research communities, um, but and which we consider is um, uh, a definite um, prerequisite to coming to impact. Um, with the, uh, another, sorry, another key element of the program was also the collaboration with the Food and Business Knowledge Platform. I mentioned it earlier, it was set up by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they played a role in selecting the research focus areas of the calls for proposals. Um, but they also, uh, together with them, we have organized many meetings to bring together research, policy, and practice. So really a key element also for the research projects to present their findings, as a, and the, the platform in that served as a knowledge hub. With the findings of these 75 projects available, we, available a year ago, we started to think, should we not make this uh, knowledge even more widely available beyond the individual projects that focus on a range of topics and are dispersed in space and time? Uh, so we decided to start up with a synthesis study. The, st uh, the synthesis study aims to bring the findings of these projects together on a range of themes to connect them to wider uh, debates in acad academia and policy and practice. So we bundled findings on areas like inclusive business, I mentioned it before, indigenous and local foods, climate smart agriculture, but also the value of smallholder production. 
not only did we look at the findings of the project, we also really looked at how did the knowledge lead to changes in reality? Have, uh, has the um, research contributed to change? Did small scale farmers indeed grow and consume more and more healthy food now? Did their income increase? Uh, did their food security increase accordingly? Did policy policies actually change due to the research? The synthesis study led to a load of interesting insights. Um, I will just highlight two here. I don't have the time to go through all of them. Uh, but two notable findings are, for instance, the first one, that the common health assumption that an increase in income of farmers leads to food and nutrition security may not actually always be the case. Uh, farmers may be interested in investing their, uh, their income in other matters than food and um, healthy food. A second finding is that um, inclusive business models are not as easy as they may sound and that they uh, require a lot of attention to be able to fit the needs of local uh, of small scale farmers. All these findings are available in a range of articles on our website, um, but we've also um, uh, developed a podcast series on them, uh, which is called Dangerous Assumptions. Um, and we also uh, have a range of webinars, which are called the Food Fights, that have been ongoing already and are still going on. And there will be a final conference on the program on 9 and 10 December, which you, of course, are very much invited to. But this evening also builds on the findings of that synthesis study. And we are here to learn, like all they said already, about how can the food system become more resilient to shocks, acute shocks like COVID, but also longer term shocks like, like climate change. And indeed, what can we learn from that work in East and West Africa, South and Southeast Asia and Latin America to make us rethink the food system in the Netherlands as well? I think we have a range of fantastic speakers here tonight. Uh, I'm very um, uh, in the room here as well as on the Zoom wall. So I think we're in for a treat and I wish you very much inspiration and a lot of insights from this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corinne. Out of cur uh, curiosity, um, based on your own experience and knowledge, what would you say is the part of the food system that needs the most shaking at this moment? Um, yeah, I think that in the first round we're going to hear our speakers refer to that, thinking about how, uh, how global needs the system to be. Can we go to more localized food systems as well? Great. Okay, yeah. we'll be continuing on that. Thank you so very Thank much. You. Corinne Lamain was that with a, an introduction to today's program. So it's time for me now to explain how the Zoom wall works. On the wall, um, we have speakers from all over the world, and they will allow us to travel across the globe um, with people who are involved in projects of, or research in countries like Benin and Ghana, Uganda and others. And the Zoom wall participants will be invited to comment in the last 10 minutes of our two panels and will provide us with global perspectives. Mm -hmm. So who are they? Um, we have uh, Flora Shadare from Benin. She is Associate Professor in Food Science and Nutrition at National University of Agriculture in the Benin Republic. She is an expert on food product development, food fortification, with focus on endogenous and other and non-timber forest products. Our second uh, wall person is Richard Jeboa from Ghana. He's an enterprising um, specialist in entrepreneurship development. He knows everything there is to know about how startups can become a sustainable entity. Then joining us from Italy is Francesco Rampa, head of the Sustainable Food Systems Team of ECDPM's Economic and Agricultural Transformation Program. That's a whole mouthful, I'm telling you. <laughs> His expertise and uh, publications are in the fields of trade policies and development, political economy, innovation, food security, and sustainable food systems. And in his work, he focuses on regional value chain development for food, uh, food security in Africa. He knows everything about climate resilience in agriculture, as well as the economic, social, and environmental sustainability of food systems. Joining us also is Charity Chelangat. She is the project coordinator at Oxfam in Uganda, who knows everything about youth empowerment and engagement projects. And last but certainly not least, also from Uganda is Julius Semyalo. He's the country projects manager Uganda of Solidaridad, Eastern and Central Africa. He knows all there is to know about mandatory and voluntary compliance requirements, 
codes of conduct and chains of custody. He, is working, uh, he has working experience on sustainable coffee, cocoa, and tea. So in that uh, respect, he's very important to our everyday staple drinks. Welcome, everybody. First, a question to welcome all of you and to, to loosen everybody up. Um, we are talking about shaking up the food system today. Who do you think is the most important shaker at this moment? And who should we really discuss? Let, let me just go uh, around the, the block, starting with Flora. Remember Thank you. Good, good day. We're talking about uh, shaking the food system. The food system uh, is defined, as I can say, as um, uh, several actors, all the actors, and the interconnection between those actors working on adding value activity related to production, aggregation, processing, uh, distribution of food that are from crop production, or uh, also from forestry or fisheries, uh, aquaculture, and all those things. Which means that it is a real system, and we have the actors, and we have the, their relationship. So if anything, or any single actor, or if any single relationship breaks down, then the whole system will collapse. Which means that, all the actors that are in the system are important so that the system remains a food system. All relationships that are between the actors in the system are important so that it remains a system. Given to that definition and also to the active part of the actors and their interrelation, I really uh, find it hard to pick out one actor or one specific uh, part of the system and to say that he is the, the biggest shaker. That's that. Anyway, the system is such a way that it can re react from the surrounding system, like the health system, like the, the energy system. So if we consider all this, we will say that all the actors are important and they are real leads of the system because without any of them, the system will collapse. And all the surrounding of the system is also important. And in the present world that we are talking about COVID-19, I think the health system has checked the food system up. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's a very nicely political answer. Thank you very much, Flora. Um, I, I would like to ask the same question to all of you, but I really do have only time for two or three remarks on the subject. So, Julius, what would you say? Who are the big shakers that we really should um, take, take notice of? I, I may not differ uh, greatly from the submission by Flora. I would think uh, the feedback loop of system thinking means that everyone has to reflect and answer the question, how do they want to see the resilience manifest along the, the, the food chains, but also the role of policy is important, the national uh, governments are important, the regional governments are important, and also global welfare. So I feel it is a question to all of us, I submit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard Jeboa, are you in agreement with, uh, with Julius? Richard from Ghana? Well, well, all things being equal, I, I will always say uh, small and medium-sized companies. I think um, at the end of it, policies will be set, um, at the end of it, research will be done, but you would need the private sector and especially the small and medium sized companies to bring the product to the consumer, uh -huh. um, to use it, to develop uh, concepts, methodologies, approaches that at the end of it, if you want to make it also sustainable, there needs to be a form of uh, financial. And I always believe that uh, most of it, SMEs, small, medium sized SMEs are always looking at inclusiveness to bring everybody on the table to make it possible. So if I have to choose, I would say small and medium sized companies. They are about to change and save the world, according to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Charity, your, 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 your answer to the same question. Um, thank you very much. Um, for me, 
understanding the food system. The food system is, uh, like already mentioned, it has a set of actors. And for me, for the food system to operate sustainably and to be resilient, then every actor has to play a role to ensure that the food system operates. But for me, for all this to happen, they need a good and conducive uh, environment to operate from. And for me, I would think that uh, the shaking needs to happen around the policymakers in terms of policies that will bring the different actors together, the policies that will guide how food is produced, how food is processed, and how food is utilized. So for me, it's around the policy making. Thank mm. you. Are they on track, according to you, the policymakers, Charity? Just a yes Pardon? or no. Will do. Are they on track, according to you? Just a yes or no. 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 Okay. <laughs> Francesco, finally, to, to end with you, the same question so that everybody is loosened up and we yeah, all I mean, know to totally, right. totally agree. Policymakers must do something different. They could be doing much, much better, in particular because we still have big corporations controlling the global food system and regulation is needed. But to, to mention another one that wasn't too strongly mentioned, I'd say the consumers. So all of us, to be honest, all of us can be the shakers here. Uh -huh. When we make, uh, when we go to the supermarket, to the town markets in many parts of the southern, of the southern world, we all have to make our choices on what is sustainable. Uh -huh. So it's really the consumer. All of us need to make a change and then markets will listen and then companies will listen. Yeah. So we will be ending this session with a view on what on the role of uh, us as individuals. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Thank you so much, Zoom Wall, for the moment. Uh, please stay alert because I'm going to have the first uh, panel discussion now and I will be looking for your input afterwards. So in that very first uh, panel today, we examine the way our food system is under pressure uh, from an acute crisis uh, like COVID-19. Uh, let's introduce the topic with a short video. Indigenous food are made out of products that are sourced locally from the white or traditionally raised plants. There are foods that are integrated to the cultural food habit of a specific locality. They are very rich in nutrients in antioxidants and bioactive compounds. should benefit from uh, the promotion of uh, indigenous food are the resource poor people, the less favored people. And this is because they suffer the most from hidden hunger, which can be alleviated uh, with the local food. Uh, first of all, the local community who are the owner of authentic knowledge on these uh, resources. Second one, we think about the researcher who will investigate uh, and improve knowledge on this local food. And also they will develop technologies and new technologies that can promote the, the valorization of this food. So joining me for this uh, seg segment of the program are Katie Minderhout, who currently works as learning advisor at Solidaridad Europe. Her particular expertise is on the landscape approach with a focus on uh, land governance and food security. And she has also worked on a project on local side effects of Dutch investments in Ghana. And to my right, your left, is Nikki Pau, Associate Professor in the Economics of Well-Being at the uh, University of Amsterdam. And in her work, she puts human well-being at the center instead of economic growth. She's also led a project on women food entrepreneurs and local and indigenous foods. Welcome both to you. A short reaction for, uh, to the video. First you, please, Katie. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, when 
looking at the video, uh, what strikes me is the variety of products and it sparks my curiosity towards local food culture and it makes you realize how widely diverse that is and I think we all know that feeling when when traveling and uh, going to a market and that you're surprised by this wide variety. Um, and secondly, uh, I think what's also clear from the images we saw is that people are organized around these products. So it's really, I think it was referred to by the uh, through Zoom as well, uh, that the relationships, the capacities, and also the knowledge around these products, those are really important ingredients to actually uh, produce and process and market mm -hmm. uh, these products and contribute to food security yeah. in that way. So, and this knowledge that you're referring to now is local knowledge? Local knowledge. Yes, yeah. okay. Uh, Nikki, how about you? How did you look at the video? Yeah, I think uh, the video clearly shows that uh, there is maybe a hidden potential of looking at indigenous foods and crops, um, especially in countries where food insecurity is still an acute problem. Um, if we look at the uh, African continent, for example, one in every uh, five people are undernourished. Mm -hmm. um, so this uh, points out that we really need to address food insecurity. Um, however, the way uh, governments and private sectors are programmed these days is to resolve food insecurity through the modernization of agriculture and very much through formal market-based systems. Mm -hmm. Whereas, um, as was also mentioned in the video, indigenous foods and crops are very much produced and processed in the informal economy. And this is typically not on the uh, policy agenda of uh, policy makers, nationally and internationally. Um, and I would just say it, it is very much a blind spot at the moment. So could you walk us through why indigenous foods are helping food systems to be more resilient, more, more able to cope with crisis in this, in this case? Well, I think, of course, there are different types of crises, but what the COVID-19 crisis has particularly pointed out is that um, old uh, ways of responding to crises, uh, food crises, uh, do not work any longer. So, for example, when there is a shock to the food system and a supply chain comes to a halt, it was relatively easy for governments in the past to uh, refer to another supply chain and organize that, so that at least food access was not jeopardized. But uh, the uh, COVID-19 crisis uh, made that not an option to politicians. Because of closed borders, etc. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, the attention was uh, reverted back to, uh, to within country systems. And there, yeah, and then naturally uh, the, the production and processing systems that are nat nat uh, nationally in place come to the fore. Um, but these are highly underdeveloped, I would say, and, and many uh, producers and processes that are engaged in indigenous uh, foods and crops production operate in the informal economy. Um, and, and, many, and their products and uh, produce are not always uh, legalized or authorized because um, it is not valorized. Uh, you mean quali on, on the quality uh, of it? Exactly, yes. mm -hmm. the quality of it. It is not uh, certified, it has not been tested. Um, there is a local market for it because of personal ties uh, producers manage to sell. But the moment you want to sell outside the community and mm. service other markets, this quality becomes an issue. I see. So maybe maybe that's what we should be focusing on, because I, I do think that um, in those parts where indigenous foods and local foods are being consumed, they have been doing that for ages and ages. Definitely. It's Definitely. only when we want that food that we have these certif certificates yeah. that we... Okay, got that. Um, uh, uh, Katie, what would you say has been so far the most important effect of COVID-19 uh, on the food system? Yes, well... Uh, with that question, the first word that comes in my mind is disruption. 
so that the impact of COVID is disruption in our daily lives and also disruption in the food system. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most importantly is a restriction in our movement, which means that uh, consumers cannot go to market, but you can imagine what it means for logistics and supply chains um, in terms of transport, um, but also movement of labor so that the actual harvest could not take place. We've seen examples of that in Europe as well, where uh, people are allowed to travel because otherwise the harvest is at stake. So I think disruption um, on many different levels and what that also uh, uh, shows is our dependency because in the end we all need food. Uh, so it's a, it's a real... Um, priority huh. and it shows how, how vulnerable we are uh, if, if we cannot access that. And most importantly, since it's a health crisis, I think there is more attention for, for healthy food and more appreciation for, the, for access to a variety of fresh food um, that we need to, to be healthy and to also deal yes. with COVID in that sense. Well, they do say that local food is the best way to boost your immune system. So maybe we shouldn't even be shopping for it elsewhere. That's just my opinion. How do you, how do you look at that? You mean we should only eat what is produced within our borders? Yes. Or? Yes, well, I think that opens up a whole a different topic. Uh -huh. um, but I do think, like, to answer it shortly, I think diversity is, uh, is the answer. So we need a diversity of uh, different food products for a healthy diet. And also that can be diversity in where it comes from. And of course, with huge attention for how it is produced. And I think, uh, yeah, looking at uh, climate change around the corner and also our responsibility to re reduce our carbon footprint with our diets. Mm -hmm. But that, yeah, so it is, a, I think, um, uh, yeah, some have alluded already how all these different systems are so interlinked. Yes. That makes it hugely complex. Everything is everything, like they say. But on the positive side, I do think, like, the focus on, for example, uh, indigenous foods, by taking that focus, you look differently at the opportunities that our food system holds. So that's th something which I'm really optimistic about. We got, a, we got an optimistic note, that's great. Um, we in the West, we tend to, um, well, we want it all. Can I, can I say, I mean, we want our own food, we want food from elsewhere, but we don't consume it all. Is that something we should be looking at as well when we're talking about um, the carbon footprint, mm -hmm. the, uh, the way we consume, what, what we get from where? Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think food waste is an issue uh, in many countries in the world, in the West, uh, but also in these projects uh, that were uh, conducted in countries in the global south. Food waste was a recurring issue. Um, and um, uh, so I can give an example of Kenya, for example, where we were working with women, women food entrepreneurial groups. And in Kenya, the climate is such that in most parts of the country, there is enough food available. But a lot of it, a lot of the fresh food goes to waste uh, because people do not have the assets to uh, maintain or to keep the food fresh or there's not enough food being processed uh, to maintain a longer shelf life. Um, so uh, if, if you go to a market there, at the end of the market day, a lot of food goes to waste. Mm -hmm. And I know in uh, uh, many Western countries, but far not enough, there are systems in place that then collect these waste and, and do something useful with it so that there is a circularity emerging in the economy. And, um, and, and at smaller scale, uh, that was also tried in uh, Kenya, where uh, women uh, or women groups started to collect the food waste in the market and turn it into organic manure and then sell it so that there was a new business model coming out yeah. of that, which was very How did that, how did that uh, turn out? Uh, it turned out to be uh, yeah, a win-win situation yeah. for everyone involved. Yes. And, but we did have to um, assist in uh, helping them to link up to official uh, uh, standards bureaus again to 
test the organic manure to see what is in there, the, to ascertain the quality, mm -hmm. and to be able to put a label on it, so that indeed you can market it. Because if uh, we use the wrong manure, that means the product would not would not comply with our uh, rules and regulations. Yes, but also there in 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 other markets, in regional markets or uh, within cities, mm -hmm. people want to know what's what's in there. Yeah. And, uh, that quality assurance is yeah. important. What would you say, uh, and, and, and Nikki, is the most urgent problem that we need to address at this point? Um, the most urgent problem is to assist people who pull the short end of the stick, because the, the crisis, as uh, Katie was uh, saying, has laid bare uh, some of the weaknesses and the risks of our food systems, very much in the same way as our health systems, by the way. Um, and um, uh, people who are um, at risk uh, of losing their job uh, are hit double. Uh, not only uh, is there the direct effect of food access that has become more difficult, um, because, for example, uh, local markets or places where people used to uh, buy their food were closed, um, but also uh, people with low incomes or uh, being employed in temporary labor, or in informal job, uh, their source of income suddenly stopped, so they, that has a direct impact also on their consumption mm -hmm. levels. And then to resort to supermarkets that are still open, the food there is of course more expensive, so they are hit double. Triple. And I, triple, yeah, so we need to uh, pay, yeah, pay most of our attention to, yes. to, the, to right. the people at the bottom. I hear you. So, so Katie, that means um, we are dependent on, on different uh, regions in the world for our food. Um, I know that because I've traveled extensively in, in both uh, areas, no, in all three of them. Um, crops are now different from what the people used to grow, and they are growing now what we need. So that means we come in and we, uh, we uh, affect the land, we, we change the environment, we change the climate by changing the environment. This to me sounds like a circle that, that's very hard to, to, to come out of. How, how, can we, how can we change this? That's a very big question to uh, ask. Well, that's why they asked me to come today. I think, uh, first of all, like, um, in a way, uh, how, how I perceive the food system being Dutch and indeed how our Dutch economy also relies on a lot of uh, imp imports, um, I, I think I want to turn it around a bit. I think there is a lot of attention for economic opportunities uh, in terms of value chain development and how uh, different in this, I would think of Af different African countries that can um, uh, export uh, crops. But I think what makes this discussion so interesting and that is that it's actually, there are huge markets locally where people uh, are, um, are looking for a, a wide diversity of, of food products. And if the attention is only on uh, foreign markets or on specific cash crops, I think we leave out a very important spectrum uh, of, of uh, what we need to produce to feed people locally, to serve their needs, but also to have food production system that actually fits the environment. Because if you look at how indeed, how much impact certain crops have, uh, if you produce them on large scale and they, and they transform landscapes and not necessarily for the better, but actually for the worse. I think we, we have gone quite far down the road of uh, dependency on, on fewer crops with negative impacts on uh, the production landscapes. So I mean, maybe it's a mantra. I think diversity really is the key to, to resilience. Yes. So yeah. diversity in markets and products in production systems, uh, there's. So is that, is that feasible, I'm asking? I think if you mobilize, if you work with the people who are there and you tap into their knowledge and their relationships, if you put that at the center, like uh, what Nikki is also focusing on, human well-being, I think in, in the end that's, uh, that's where the change happens. Uh -huh. yeah. do, do we do that quite enough, Nikki? No, far not enough. <laughs> I think there are some good examples of countries who try to do that uh, in the world, but they're the minority. And uh, it's true what Katie says, that 
the, our globalized food systems are embedded in a certain way of looking at the economy and how the economy functions, where GDP growth is very much put at the center and where um, yeah, effects on climate, uh, on, on um, our living world, on, on our social relationships are considered as a second order effect and they are not taken into account a priori when we are making decisions about um, how to organize our food production systems, mm -hmm. but also how to organize our trade systems. Yeah. I think through international trade, there are a lot of uh, cheap food products uh, entering markets in the global south and they create unequal competition for producers there. Um, so I think we need to look at it more in uh, coherence with these other policies. You mentioned that uh, there are a couple of countries doing quite well. H how are the Netherlands doing on that scale? Um, I think the Netherlands could do better, <laughs> especially in terms of agricultural subsidies, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a world to gain. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are initiatives that we could learn from and why? What, what comes to mind? Well, um, in preparation for today, I did dig into the synthesis article, which I highly recommend uh, also the viewers to, to read. The synthesis article, which, which brings together all the findings around the 75 the, studies. Well, and specifically on the indigenous foods. Mm -hmm. And um, a really inspiring example, I thought, was um, uh, one of the projects in Benin. They uh, developed nutritional maps. So for specific, for 12 agroecological zones in Benin, they mapped all the different uh, food products and their nutritional um, content. So I think that's a way of, well, first of all, the effort of bringing together that knowledge is a huge work, but also to make it accessible in, in, uh, in a visual way by means of a map. I think it's so this map actually shows which part of, of a region uh, a certain crop is being uh, being being produced. Yeah, but I think it, it was over 300 different uh, products, so like specific plants, etc., with very specific nu nutritional qualities. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of uh, opens up this whole body of knowledge where you realize how diverse uh, a country is and what it has to offer uh, in, in, in diet and food. So I, I thought it was an interesting example because um, I've seen those maps for the Netherlands as well, which regions are specific for certain agricultural sectors. Mm -hmm. But this is on a different level because it's a, well, again, it's on, on the wide diversity mm -hmm. and also with attention for the agroecological zones which are suitable to grow those. So I think it brings together this body of knowledge which which has this holistic uh, view of the of the food system which we which we need. Yeah, do you yeah. think such a thing would be uh, applicable here in the Netherlands? What well, a change that would I be? Would, I would wonder what would be left on it. No, no, no. I think, yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah, but for for a lot of countries, I think uh, mm -hmm. I think we forget uh, the diversity in our food system for most of the time. Okay. Although we have everything at our fingertips in the supermarket, at least here in the Netherlands, but like, where does it come from? Uh, we don't that really... connection with place yeah. is it is uh, a bit lost. So that's something that consumers could 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 teach themselves to be more aware of. Yeah, you know, if those yeah. maps those maps could definitely help definitely. them. So they're an yeah. inspiring example, I think. I agree. Um, let me see. Uh, what 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 can we learn from the local side effects of Dutch investments? Who who, who wants this question? I, I guess maybe you. Um, of Dutch investments in indigenous foods, yes, for example, yes. yes, that were part and parcel of these research projects. Um, well, to, mind, uh, to my mind comes an example of um, an initiative in Zambia, where um, there was an exploration of the uh, added value of uh, fermented foods. Um, and where, which is uh, uh, you, uh, mostly produced by uh, women uh, at home um, within an informal environment. Uh, but these foods are known to be highly uh, nutritious, very rich in uh, nutrient contents. And, uh, More so than the, than the raw food? No, I wouldn't think so. Um, not necessarily, but they have a longer shelf life right. because mm -hmm. it's fermented. Mm -hmm. So um, it, in that sense, it can also stabilize the food system over a longer time. 
And uh, in that particular project, they teamed up with pharma cooperatives and with um, the Zambia uh, Standards Bureau, again, to, uh, uh, to also test what exactly are the nutrient values, because it is largely undocumented knowledge. And we know it is diverse, but, but there's not real, um, let's say, scientific data mm -hmm. on what exactly are the nutrient values. So there's a win-win collaboration possible, yeah. and that happens. And now they're going to run parallel projects in, uh, in Benin and, and in Zimbabwe. I'm, I do must say that there's, at the same time, a risk when, when uh, governments and, uh, start to invest in uh, indigenous food production that big commercial parties will step in and take over. So there's also a role there to be played to, to, uh, yeah, to help protect these yes. uh, small-scale producers and give them time and, and, and opportunity to build up their, uh, and, uh, build up their business. Yes, and, and maybe keep it local without, like yeah, you maybe. said, the big yeah. companies yeah. coming in and yeah. taking I over. I mean, uh, upscaling up to a certain level and professionalization, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. but uh, preventing uh, yeah, big commercial companies to take over. Okay. Um, I'm curious to know what our Zoom wall thinks of uh, the, the, the conversation we've been having. Uh, Francesco, I would like to start with you. Uh, you are one of the authors of the paper that we discussed. How did you listen to this conversation, Francesco? Well, thanks. I, uh, I agree with most of what uh, was said. And, um, and I think we have an opportunity, I mean, looking at the short term, um, to me, what would be crucial to Diversity, totally agree. Diversity is the key uh, in every food system, including in Europe. So there's a lot that needs to be done here as well. Uh, but I would say in, in uh, the southern part of the world, we need to involve the financial markets. Until we convince banks and investors that there is money to be made in a shortening value chain in supporting indigenous vegetables, things will not change because you know, even small farmers need investment in order to scale up the production, for example, of indigenous vegetables. So crucial is to involve uh, banks and the financial markets. And for that, we probably need to find a way. There's a, there's a term called true cost accounting. You know, you need to actually have prices and markets reflect how much water we're using, how much benefit we're giving to women empowerment, how much nutritional benefit we all get from this type of indigenous food. If we could find a way for prices, and credit instruments to reflect really what's behind production of food, I think we will find a way to give a premium of prices, generate more money for those who produce indigenous vegetables. And that to me would be a game changer. Uh, and then quickly, I want to say the next year, because of COVID, I think we have to look at COVID also, apart from the, of course, dramatic situation, we have to look at it for, for an opportunity to really shake up the food system exactly, because it's crucially part of also the way our bodies respond and population responds. So COVID should be seen as an opportunity to look at, at our food systems. And next year, there's so many important, crucial meetings where governments, civil society, and private sector can change things together. Yeah. There is even a World Food Summit. Mm -hmm. There is the COP26 on climate. These big events of so 2021, to me, is a, is, is a place where we have to bombard with the messages that we need to shake up the food system. And I think next year is a special year where we will have a lot of attention from politicians, journalists. So it's great you started, but next year is even more important than 2020 for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. K Katie, would you like to shortly uh, respond? No. Well, I, I like uh, how Francesco is looking towards the future. And he's, it seems like uh, we're only getting ready for to push this message. Uh, more. Yeah, so that's that's good. Yeah, Nikki. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, credit is in incredibly important, and um, uh, in the during the crisis, this was of course something that stopped uh, for some, and and this has yeah aggravated the problems for small producers. Mm -hmm. So uh, I agree with Francesca. Yeah. So Flora, you participated uh, in a local food project in uh, Benin. Uh, how did you listen to this conversation, Flora? Your research, your research is helping to make indigenous foods more popular. So, so how do you get people on board and th th those kind of questions, Flora? Uh, also, I agree with them. 
I indeed participated to the project that uh, realized the nutritional map. map. Uh, it, it was just talked about. And in the project, we really uh, work to make full use of local food for the nutritional benefits of the people. And the diversity is key, is uh, really key. And uh, through that project, we could find a whole diversity of uh, products. And we've shocked like uh, this one, like uh, COVID-19. I think most important uh, is that uh, the distance between the consumers and the food is reduced, which means that the value chain somehow needs to be reduced for a time before getting larger and larger again. And indigenous food and local foods are particularly aligned with uh, those conditions because they are really diverse. You can have spices, energy foods, fruits, uh, vegetables, all those we need to have an equilibrated diet. And also they are mainly uh, produced in home garden, which are a very small piece of area, but with very high diversity of plant foods and also very high diversity of medicinal plants. Mm -hmm. That I found very interesting. I would like to stress that the valorization of those food need to be better uh, highlighted and need to be better scaled up. Research is key to produce good technology for valorization. But as uh, uh, Mrs. Kitty was saying, it is also important to prevent uh, uh, taking all the opportunities from the local people because they are authentic, authentic the, the tenter of the knowledge. So it's also important that they really get profit from, from this local food mm -hmm. in, in the situa situation of the world. Thank, thank you, Flora. Nikki, short uh, reaction? Um, yeah, the threshold to, uh, to do that themselves as small producer is of course too high. And uh, I think there's a great awareness that, that they need this kind of valorization, but it's just, uh, the institutions uh, for organizing that and the money that is needed for that is simply not there. Mm -hmm. So then there is a threshold that cannot be passed All right. unless uh, uh, they organize together and there is collaboration with other stakeholders in mm -hmm. the value chain. Uh, th this valorization, uh, could that be done locally as well? Definitely, yes. Uh, we, we've done it in, uh, in Kenya and Kisumu, for example, together with the local laboratory and uh, a university that was nearby. So you ne need a multitude of stakeholders, mm -hmm. but definitely at the local level by and nationally authorized institute that can be done. Yes, yeah. and, and then the, the fight about which, which, is, uh, which quality is good enough and which isn't would be done on a higher level instead of... Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly, but at yeah. least you make it transparent then right. and you give consumers locally and regionally or internationally even uh, access to this kind of information. Here you go. Uh, Katie, how, how, how would you react to what Flora just uh, said? Yeah, to what Flora said, but also to what Nikki said, because I think um, as we're discussing here the 75 projects of, of Enrio Votro, I think they are uh, in a way like uh, really interesting um, way to bring together these partners to identify the opportunities mm -hmm. and to and to seek these opportunities for valorization and what is required uh, also in terms of market acceptance and mm -hmm. consumer preference so um, it it shows that you need research you need uh, producer organ producers producer organizations uh, also private sector also government so you need them all mm -hmm. and 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 you need the means to uh, fund that process that mm -hmm. partnership process mm -hmm. and you also need to allow for the time uh, and often if if there is a focus on valorization from a business point of view then we're looking for the business case and we're not really mixing the ingredients of these different actors. Um, Money talks. Yeah, <laughs> yes. but you need a lot of people yeah, <laughs> to exactly. make it work. Exactly. Yeah. I have time for one more question or comment from the Zoom wall. Who would like to uh, raise their hand and uh, take part in this conversation? Nobody? Julius. Ah, Julius, yes. Yes, Julius. 
Yes, I thank you, and uh, I, I like the way the discussion is going on. And uh, uh, we've seen that the actors, the consumer, especially the consumer in the Netherlands, in, in Europe, will have to take uh, a consideration of the externalities. I've, I've liked the point by Francisco on true pricing or true, cross, true cost accounting. Therefore, they will read the labels to be aware of the food miles. But also, they will uh, do some gardens on herbs and spices. Of course, we shall see, still sell you uh, the staple uh, commodities you've mentioned, like coffee, cacao, and the others from other agroecologies. But what we would like to see is to also future proof the, the forgotten or the orphaned. Uh, food security commodities in the South so that these can come up and then inclusive financing can take them to the stage where safety issues are taken care of, but also grading so that some of these can also come to global welfare, but then the rest can go to the local economies. The project I uh, participated in, I coordinated, uh, funded by Nuo Otro, was on grafted tomato. So we were tackling a limiting factor, which is the bacterial wilt. Now, we were designing this project to reach the high-end markets. We had a dedicated off-taker, and we were going to green grocers and the supermarkets. Then COVID struck, yeah. and this collapsed. Now, the resilience of the farmers and the young people I work with said, well, we can uh, use WhatsApp to, uh, for people to order and we, we do home deliveries. That was a, a disruptive uh, response, I, I, which was not part of the design. And it came out because of the crisis. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, the consumers were happy with the quality, interestingly. And when I asked the farmers, they said, no, we have to deliver quality tomatoes because we have a relationship with these few consumers. And if we break this, we will have nowhere to sell. Uh, and lastly, uh, this project was about tomato, but the farmers also now introduced the indigenous vegetables because they could sell cheaper and they could move. We call it a sukuma wiki, which is kale. And then they also included the tomato as onions alongside tomatoes and other offer which means now they were looking at uh, uh, like a community supported agriculture program, like a food basket offer to the consumers. These are things that came out of resilience thinking of the, of the farmers. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Julius. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time, but I see both of you nodding, so I assume you are both in uh, agreement with what Julius just told us. Thank you very much for this uh, conversation, uh, Katie Minderhout and Nikki Pao. And um, we, we, we should look into it more. We should... We should read the synthesis. Read study. the synthesis. <laughs> it's not dry stuff. Can anybody no. read it? <laughs> it's very good to read. It, it's, very, it, it's something I would pick up on the weekend and just go, wow, I'm so glad I read that. Yes. Good. That's good to know. Thank you again, both of you. So we're moving on to the second panel uh, in which we will concentrate on the resilience of our food system to longer term crises uh, such as climate change. Here's a short video to introduce the topic. Circular agriculture is a system thinking of all food focused stakeholders about minimizing the wastage of food at each value chain through closing the nutrient loop and empowering both producers and consumers. Circular agriculture may be a solution for long-term shocks like climate change. This is because in circular agriculture, there is no such thing as waste. This whole process requires less land, less water, and reduced ecological footprints. Producers and consumers should benefit from circular agriculture because producers should not lose their uh, finance or money and also consumers should not 
pay more than their usual food expenditure. So it must be uh, a win-win. I want to find out who should benefit from secular agricultural innovations. So as I was saying, apart from COVID, there's that slower moving crisis going on that we hardly have any time for these days. The climate crisis, how does that affect our uh, food supply quality and globally and, and what kind of responses to that effect are taking place? And very important too, what can the Netherlands learn from initiatives in other countries? Joining me now are Wijnand van Eysel, he's a senior, uh, senior policy officer at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He specializes in the domain of food and nutrition security, rural development and environmental management in the framework of Dutch development uh, cooperation. And on this side of me is Rob Lubberink. He is now an independent researcher, but he worked as a researcher for the NWO WOTRO project at uh, Wageningen University here in the Netherlands. He currently works together with uh, local support organizations in Malawi to develop a, a remote rapid response intervention to stimulate smallholder uh, resilience in time of social distancing. Gentlemen, welcome both of you. A short you. Uh, reaction to the video we just saw. Wijnand, you first, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic. You know, you see a, a lot of different uh, initiatives and very creative initiatives. Um, it it aligns with one one of the messages that I would say uh, is there. That is, you know, there anybody who would have hoped there would be a, a silver bullet to uh, circular agriculture, the climate crisis, you know, uh, will have to be disappointed. You need many, many different uh, initiatives and many different solutions in different contexts. And, you know, you see that variety here uh, in the in the video. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a lot more of that. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Are you impressed by what you see? Yeah, it's good. And it's also um, interesting from this uh, research approach that very often the value chain is incorporated already in in the research approach so mm -hmm. you know, yeah you already build on a on a business case as well yes yeah. rob how about you i really enjoyed to watch this video first of all because um you saw people who were enjoying what they were doing who were trying out something new so there's learning taking place and i think the learning from trying out new things is 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 a crucial element of uh, resilience of a system, whether it's organizations, people, households, or the, eco the social ecological system as a whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this is, this is one pathway for change towards a more resilient system. Or yeah. What, what, what would you say is the most important effect of climate uh, change on the food system as we know it? Oh, well, um, there, there are so many effects. And I think w one thing is that it's quite linear way of thinking that, you know, the climate change affects the food system. So, for example, in my case, in um, during one of my fieldwork experiences in Malawi, uh, a densely populated country uh, in, in Africa where people um, engage in deforestation for more agricultural land to feed their, their households, where people uh, were growing tobacco for our cigarettes, but for the tobacco they also need to engage in deforestation. Well, what you see is that there is um, there are extreme droughts uh, that dry out the, the the soil. At the same time, there's also extreme rainfall. So what you see is that actually there's an interaction effect from the deforestation and the rainfall that leads to soil erosion and the loss of nutrients mm -hmm. in the soil. So there you see actually that it's not the climate affecting the, the, the food system or the agricultural system, but it's actually the connect the connection between them and how they are connected in mm -hmm. each other that creates a kind of interaction effect which has yeah huge implications for in the end food and nutrition security of mm -hmm. course of the farmers the thing about deforestation once you start you, you can't really go back can you um 
Well, I mean, it's hard to uh, to do so, but I think we should look at, uh, at at ways how to try to do that. Um, maybe not only ways to engage in reforestation in the global south, right? So that we offset our carbon footprint, and then somewhere else there's trees being planted. But also, for example, we could think how can we reforest parts of the Netherlands. I think uh, mm -hmm. we should look in different ways at it. Yeah. 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 Uh, what would you say, Vainant, is the most urgent problem uh, when it comes to this and, and then how should we be talking about it let alone tackle it yeah what is the most you know you've you've introduced it as a as a slow moving uh, <laughs> crisis which is i think is right maybe uh, a lot of people know the cartoon where you see this boxing ring where with the the covid boxers uh, in the ring and this giant standing outside the ring waiting to step in which says climate change um, so this this is uh, this is going to be a long uh, battle um, and and uh, it is a it's a grave concern it's a very grave concern because um, like uh, a little bit in parallel with the covid crisis um, if if uh, our farming systems that particularly in the south are further you know deteriorating or you know becoming even more fra fragile than very often they are already um, then you know things can it, it it if that that can easily destabilize your your agricultural systems and thereby it destabilizes uh, society as well and that is uh, that is a grave concern uh, it, it will then increase poverty uh, and there's uh, and there's a very clear link between poverty and hunger and malnutrition and uh, so so you, you get into that and you get into migration we know you know what what the problems that will uh, mm -hmm. will uh, entail so, moreover so a second one is if you know you you tend then very often the response is to to look at the calories uh, because hunger is more of a fear than poor nutritious foods um, and so you you focus again on, on on the calories and on the staples and some of the examples that we've seen uh, mm -hmm. the more nutritious stuff uh, loses out on uh, on that and that affects the population very much yeah so yeah. this is a systemic thing that we're talking about how, how can we deal with it what, what would you suggest well, yeah, how, how, again, um, there's no there's no silver bullet uh, for that. We, we need uh, a lot more um, of these kind of initiatives, but you you call it systemic, uh, and we are only at the beginning of seeing it as a system, uh, and we have to make real progress there and fast, uh, because agriculture used to be here, and you know nutrition used to be there as part of the health system. And uh, water was uh, something about river management and uh, water supply, drinking water supply. But these things, they they all link up together. Uh, climate change, of course. Uh, and so we we only starting to see it as a system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Rob, in the previous panel, we were discussing circularity uh, of the uh, agricultural systems. Uh, would, would that work for for climate change as well to, to introduce more circularity? Or not? Well, that's that's one pathway for change, right? So this circularity focuses on the efficiency of the nutrition cycle, mm -hmm. um, and that's a, that's a political view on what a food system should do or should try to achieve. You can also think about um, food systems um, that try to give um, uh, people access to 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 food, or a food system that focuses on nutritious food or uh, food for all. So there are different uh, views on what a, what a food system should be. Uh, should be and with vested interests as well, of course, uh, behind it. The thing with the uh, circularity, what I see here is that, yes, it is something that can be good for the climate. Um, but at the same time, if we look at this idea of resilience, um, these change can become uh, these these circular economic chains or systems can become very very complex where people depend on each other so the moment that something goes wrong somewhere the whole chain is affected the whole chain is affected and then does it actually generate resilience or does it also come with certain forms of vulnerability and especially in the context in in, in Malawi for example there can be many things that that are going wrong if you if you rely on the on the power grid then it's already one vulnerability in the system mm -hmm. um, so these are the things that need to be taken to into account it can work but it has to be context specific and um, um, I think it is 
very important that the different actors are actually present at the table to see where challenges are and how challenges are interrelated mm -hmm. because people perceive challenges differently. And, and who should be instigating? Um, I don't want to point fingers. In, in our case, for example, what we did, we organized uh, workshops where um, the government was present, where smallholder farmers were present, where private industry was present and support organizations. Mm -hmm. um, anyone could initiate such workshops. But the most important thing was actually that people started to understand that the problem of somebody else actually in the end became their own problem because in the end things are interrelated. And that's already one win from such a workshop that people start to you know, perceive problems in different ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I often wonder, this is maybe slightly off topic, but I often wonder if, if um, uh, Western countries have, have a mindset that tells them that, you know, we, we know what needs to be done and <laughs> please learn from us, poor people. Um, does, that, does that apply? Yes, and that's all. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I, I get a bit um, nervous or, or agitated when there is indeed like sometimes it's coined, coined as a silver bullet. So this idea of the circular agriculture, it, to some extent, it departs from the idea that it's that is not there. Um, I mean, I was in the field. If you see how creative people are with using the resources that they have, it and um, and and making use of, of waste, what they actually consider as valuable products, for example, as input for the cows. Um, there is so much that we could actually uh, learn. The other thing, for, with, for example, give me one example. What is one thing we could learn? And and. Oh, so um, what you see is that, for example, um, the, the staple crop in Malawi is, is maize, which they use for sima. So the leftover from the maize, right, that's what they use to give to the cow. What, what I really, um, um, what, what I found interesting was in the, le in the lean season when there is very little food, actually people start to eat also the, the peel of the maize. And at the maize mill, where normally they would, get the, they would say, no, we're not giving it to you anymore because it goes to the cows, whereas actually people need it. So there's a kind of informal self-organizing governance mechanism that says, okay, at this stage, given the lack of food, we make give different it to decisions. The people. Yes, yeah. Oh, oh, not yeah, same question to you, actually. Yeah, no, it's, it, there are different perceptions of what the food system is, as, uh, as Rob was saying. And so yeah. I think uh, you need to, you know, uh, underlying of the discussion needs to be a sort of a joint analytical framework uh, locally uh, on what that means in, for example, uh, Malawi, and then and get, get a different set of stakeholders around. And, you know, the government is is a, is a big, a very diverse thing, you know. Uh, who is the government? You know, if, if you're having the Ministry of Agriculture there, or the Ministry of Health, or the Ministry of Planning and Investment, you know, th those are very different actors in the, in the playing field. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very um, um, uh, aware of the, of the need of having these, uh, also within a government framework, different players around the, around the table in, in that joint analytical framework. And then the action planning on what, what, where are the critical bottlenecks and where we have to act. Yeah. 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 If I can follow up on, um, on your point, uh, what we, for example, also see in, um, in the movie is a win-win situation. And what we often have, especially when we come in with projects, is a quite exploitative engagement with nature, as in, you know, this is something that's good for nature and it brings money, you know, and it is a business model. Um, whereas I don't want to romanticize the rural, but indigenous communities also have a spiritual engagement yes. with, uh, with their environment uh, and a more stewardship relationship uh, with the environment. So I think we should also um, open up our... Um, our mindsets towards different ways of engaging with nature than just the exp exploitative. Because when the business model is gone, right, what then happens with the nature if this is the way that we engage? So well, in our we, project, we can tell what, what happens because we're seeing it all around us. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. for example, one thing that we did in, in, in a project, we were interested in how smallholders engage in entrepreneurial behavior, um, is um, starting from African philosophies. Uh, knowing that norms, values, and, and, and mindsets, you know, are orally um, um, uh, transferred across gen generations. So, then, um, um, uh, how to say the the, the, the sayings and uh, the metaphors that they use 
um, matter a lot. So we try to understand how they inform what people do, yeah. which gives really but we, different but insights. But we, we do seem to kind of benignly laugh at those uh, traditions, don't we? Uh, I am not sure, actually. I no. think that we are more and more open to alternative ways of, uh, of, of, of thinking, mm -hmm. of, of engaging with the world. Um, it's that we, we are not aware of them. So I say again, sorry? It's rather that we are not aware of them. Uh, okay, yeah. it's, not, it's, so not a, it's not a matter yeah. of... Um, it's not a, no? So, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to tease yeah. you a little. Yeah. Uh, you, of course, are in a position uh, of, of power to make a change. Um, well. Where will that take place, that change? Is it on government level, local, consumers maybe? Yeah, well, you know, you, you, uh, the topic is shaking up the food system, and you're asking for about the, the shakers and movers, uh, of course, you know. So I think there, there are two, two things that I'd like to highlight, although I would also love to have a, a chat with uh, Greta Thunberg about food systems and the, and the climate, so that might help a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but um, Francesco already referred to it uh, in, in his uh, intervention just, uh, just now that there are there are opportunities coming up in the coming year, uh, particularly that we, for the first time ever, uh, we have a United Nations uh, Food System Summit, uh, where we really want to bring these uh, different uh, elements of the food system together and hopefully come to a, a, a much greater awareness and a, a action agenda to move the, that forward. Mm -hmm. um, um, we are late into the game, I would say. Uh, yes, you know, I was um, just going to ask you what uh, kind of uh, what kind of timetable are we looking at here? Yeah, well, you know, well, of, of course we have the timetable of the Sustainable Development Goals till 2030. 2030. Mm -hmm. That's 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 just around the corner, really. That's around the corner. It's going to be a hard one, but you know, the world doesn't stop uh, turning at uh, 2030. So mm -hmm. we also have to look uh, uh, beyond that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay. So that is that is one. Uh, opportunity to really uh, you know, bring it on the agenda and the awareness and hopefully move uh, something on it. For mm -hmm. them, that's more short term than in, in doing that. In the medium term, I think I have faith in, in, in the youth. So I'm talking about Greta, but you know, in the more general sense, um, we um, I have great faith in that the youth will come up with different solutions and different uh, ideas and, and, and much more creative uh, innovations uh, to 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 help yeah. uh, because a lot of the thinking is still you know from my generation which Our was mind, educated yes. in the, well Rob in the that, that that leaves us with 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 you because uh, at this table you are the youth um, what. Thank you. That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think is needed from businesses and governments and, and other important players to contribute more resilient food systems in West and East and uh, Africa and in South and Southeast Asia? Oh, um, so related to, you know, who, sh who should shake up the food system, um, that, that's the perspective of you know, whether it's, whether it's a, a person or an organization. And I think the biggest shaker at the moment is actually climate change. So that's already a different way that we should think, you know, are, are, are humans always the ones that create a change? Mm -hmm. um, but related to that, we know from resilience studies that what makes a system resilient, there are several things. One thing is diversity. Uh, diversity in, in different approaches, in different uh, ways that, uh, that, that people connect. So one problem to resilience is actually that people are indirectly influencing each other, but they are badly connected. And uh, we know that information exchange fosters resilience. And the last thing is experimentation and learning. Um, so that's also why um, um, being an engaged scholar and an action researcher, um, and, and I don't know, I think it is age independent, but um, no, it isn't. this opportunity for, for learning and for experimentation, I think it is, uh, I mean, we have to act now and we have to learn now. And I mm -hmm. think there's a joy in learning, as you can see in the, in the video. Um, and governments sh should create space for experimentation and learning. Um, so scaling up one initiative as you know a silver bullet and re re neglecting others, that would be at the cost of, of, of resilience in the end. Um, so the same holds for companies, same holds for civil society organizations. Um, we should create such a space. Um, 
for experimentation and learning and, and I, having... I do agree. And I do think it is age-related because with all respect, our generation, we were about, you know, development, making money and getting a big house and a big car, whereas your generation is looking towards the world as a whole. We, we, we were on a one-track uh, route. And I think your generation is actually taking wider um, aspects into account in everything you do. Um, yes and no, so I don't know whether that holds for everyone. Um, I think to some extent we have been shoehorned this um, idea of business in the global south and this startup, this Silicon Valley approach to startups. And there now um, you, you also come across this um, idea of, of businesses and business for profit and possibly, you know, setting a, a, a a kind of direction that might make the same mistakes as you know the way that we approach business here. That's what you get when money gets into play, I guess. Uh, Wijnand, what, what do you, what do you, no, no what do we need uh, from businesses to approve Dutch and European food systems on their way to becoming more local and uh, climate smart? Yeah. <clears throat> Either here or abroad. Yeah, here, here or abroad. Um, I think there's there's need for for great awareness also within the businesses of about the whole the impact in the whole uh, value chain. That's one thing. But what's interesting from what you see here with these examples that have been presented in the also in the videos and circular agriculture. Circular agriculture is also a big topic now in in the Netherlands, uh, mm -hmm. even in the government's policy. Uh, but the context is very, very different here compared to you know many other places, uh, particularly what was uh, was shown. Um, so it's interesting to see that that there there is um, there are so many different contexts, but that actually the the topics of optimizing resource use, for example, huh? is is very similar. And so uh, rather than from what can we learn from them or what can they learn from us, you know, it's it's um, it, there's great opportunity in joint learning uh, i think in this uh, in this space uh, it's, uh, it's interesting yeah. well thank you both uh, gentlemen yeah. i think we should go to the zoom wall now are you still there zoom wall did you get a chance to listen in on what we were talking about julius let me ask for a first uh, reaction about the climate smart agriculture how, how did you listen to this panel julius I think for me it's a fantastic debate and uh, I would like to listen more if there was time. Mm. And uh, my contribution is that the learning is useful for all of us and it should be context specific. And that means research, a, a, a role for research to explore those contexts and come up with solutions that are context specific. So we need the variables that can uh, respond to the reality of climate change. We need to produce more with less. We need to take into account of externalities, the footprints of water, of carbon, and also the soil quality. So we need to use less agrochemicals. Okay. So I've had the analogy of the young and the old. I think I'm also a victim of the 1940s agriculture which uh, of course uh, promoted a lot of reliance on fossil fuel based uh, solutions that uh, uh, looked at limiting uh, factors. So if, they, if the limiting factor was nitrogen, you avail nitrogen. Now the thinking is different that we need to take into consideration of the true costs, but also the externalities. What is the effect of applying agrochemicals to the ecosystem services, to the quality of water, and uh, of course, the, the debate is continuing. The consumer has to play a role. Uh, policy, I, I like uh, Winand's contribution that, uh, well, policy and governments can do a role. And for me in the South, we would need uh, investments from the policy perspective, but also improving the rural infrastructure, like the roads for me are uh, important, the cost of internet, mm -hmm. if it can be affordable, uh, the electricity, and if there is no grid, off-grid solutions. In, in that way, then you can encourage other investors to come in. The private sector mm -hmm. will not come into an environment where they, they, they need to foot the bill of everything. So there is a, a discussion that should go on 
And uh, lastly, for me, it's, uh, I, I would like to think that uh, agroecology could be one of the solutions to consider as we do agriculture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Julius. Robert, short uh, reaction to, to what Julius just said. Um, yeah, I, I think it is uh, a great, uh, great comment, and especially the, the need for um, consistency, right? So that policy, you know, is in line with financing, is in line with uh, farming practices. Mm -hmm. Because the moment that there is basically a bottleneck, you can invest as much as you want, or if there's a policy inconsistency, yeah. but then it would be a waste. So, yeah, the synergies are crucial. Julius also said we, we need to be producing more with less. Um, that depends on the context where you are. Um, not every context we have uh, a lack of production. Um, so it needs to be very context specific. Um, he he did mention that as well. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I, I suppose you agree. Charity, how about you? How did you, what, what are your thoughts on this par uh, panel? Um, thank you very much. Uh, for me, I, I agree with the discussion that as the smallholder farmers continue to um, try to meet the pressure of increasing population and supply the food, one, they will try to create more space. And what does that mean? Space for production. They will either enter into the forest, they will enter, uh, they will deplete um, the, the swamps, the water bodies to ensure that they consistently supply food for the increasing population. But for me, this has a very huge impact, not only on the quantity of production, but also on the quality of the food that we consume in the wide uh, uh, in the global economy. Um, yeah, I know, and most of the food producers in our countries, especially for Uganda, are women. Women who are really operating in very small scale. And if you also want to increase production, they will definitely engage in use of chemicals as fertilizers, chemicals for spraying, and all this has a very negative impact on the climatic conditions. Mm -hmm. Agriculture uh, production in our countries is reliant on rain fed. It's rain fed most times. Rain fed meaning that it only relies on rainfall for production. So in this changing situation where the rainfall patterns are unpredictable, then the smallholder farmers are not in position to produce as and when it is needed. So this will require investment in irrigation, in, in other, other ways to ensure that we do not only rely on rainfall. This can definitely not be met only by smallholder smallholder farmers. This will require extra investment either from private sector, but also from governments to ensure that we continue to sustain um, to sustain the food system without uh, compromising with the future. Uh, some of the things that I would think about uh, to ensure that we maintain the food system while also being conscious about the changes in climate is one, um, again, I go back to uh, adopting the indigenous varieties. So many studies have shown that uh, local varieties or indigenous uh, crop varieties are resistant or, or they are drought tolerant, but also they are accessible for smallholder farmers at a cheaper cost in that even farmers can have community seed banks where they can access these seeds. Two, uh, we need to also um, uh, do a... a bit of zoning, zoning in terms of like in the different countries, what crop does well in which part of this country, mm -hmm. so that we are able to ensure that there is movement of food from the places where they are needed most or from places where they are not produced. Otherwise, we end up producing so much in a specific area and in the end it is wasted. So yes. for me, I think uh, then the last is maybe adopting the organic uh, ways of production. These are organic fertilizers, organic pesticides, but also ensuring that we go organic in terms of production. I know that this has been challenged several times when it comes to the debate between producing good food or making money. But I think it's also very important to ensure that we produce food that is good for human consumption, yes. as well as ensuring that the smallholder farmers make money. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Charity. Valid points you are making. Um, Vainand, would you like to react? 
Yeah, um, well, she has brought up a lot of issues. Um, she did. <laughs> you can you can choose one. Yeah, so that's um, but definitely for um, uh, in in terms of uh, the need to to continuously innovate in our uh, in in farming systems. Mm -hmm. um, um, could do a lot of research, you know, she's talking about changing climate, changing um, cropping seasons, um, changing uh, probably pests and diseases uh, that come up. So there, there's there's need for that. Uh, we are also investing that uh, very heavily in the global system on agricultural research to, to do the breeding for that, mm -hmm. to adjust the farming systems, to adjust the cropping cycles. And to be uh, to get to more resilient farming uh, systems. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the the matter element. of pesticides and and, and uh, fertilizers is, is is quite an issue in many uh, developing countries. Yeah. They, they don't like what we what we want them to do. Well, I think that would be a little bit a too general uh, statement I'm, from yeah, your yeah, yes, from your yes. side, but. Um, so in, in, in a lot of places, you know, it differs a lot. Again, uh, Africa is a huge, if, if we talk about Africa, Africa is a huge uh, continent, very, very different uh, and, and varied mm -hmm. conditions, whether you're in the Kenyan highlands or somewhere in Burkina Faso or Ma uh, Mali. Uh, but the, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, very poor soils uh, in Africa which do require inputs. Then the discussion on what kind of inputs uh, you use for that um, for the moment, we are um, uh, we are stuck also definitely with with fertilizer inputs, with intensification. So you raised the, the the issue of you know farmers expanding into forest areas um, because of the low productivity on on their their soils. Mm -hmm. If you want to counter that, that you will have to intensify on the existing uh, area, uh, use more inputs. But definitely, we also need. A lot more research into or the organic uh, uh, farming side of that, uh, into agroforestry systems. I think we are we are we are not way not doing enough on on, on that. No, yeah. and we, we we should be, and it should happen earlier than is the is the, yeah. is the, uh, oh the, the case yeah. right now. There is no time to lose. No. Really. Okay. Yeah. Um, panel, I know uh, Zoom wall people. I know you you love to talk long, but uh, that that can't be done. I, I one more short comment or question from the wall. Raise your hand, please. Yes. Um, uh, who is that? I think that's uh, I think that's Richard. Richard, is that you? Yes, that's me. Yes. Well, um, a, a small comment that I wanted to put on. I think um, the panelists already said that you need to, cont to contextualize it, but I think also we also have to uh, look at what is on the ground. If you look at Ghana, for instance, if you look at the demographic uh, dividend that we have, you see a lot of young people, uh, highly educated. If you also look at um, being a middle, uh, low middle income country, you have a lot of consumers that have money, but they don't have access to these products. So when I talk about private sector, I think we need to also make a distinction between local indigenous small businesses and the multinationals. And I think sometimes in a debate, we confuse it with private sector as if they are all bad. But even the products from the farms need to come to the city. And who do, who do that? That are the private small uh, businesses that are employing young people, are keeping them having income, and therefore they're also able to buy products. And therefore you create a local economy that can stimulate all these things. And I think sometimes in the debate, you forget about the local of it in the country, even if you look at West Africa, we have more than uh, 400 consumers. So it's a huge market that you can really solve a lot of these challenges that we are talking about. Yeah. But if you only look at the north-south issue, then yes, then there's a lot of conflicts. But I think that is something that we also really have to bring into this kind of discussions. And I think the research uh, and and they all research Votro helped really to also bring the local knowledge and translate it into the local situation. And then now the issue is then how do you do scale up of these things? And then how do you make sure that um, all parties are involved to bring this scale up to Val the next level? Valid point, uh, Richard. And you made it before the, the, the importance of the small and, and, and middle sized uh, companies. Uh, you were nodding vigorously, Vainant. Uh, scaling up is, uh, is indeed a, a, whole, a whole, uh, whole new topic, which is, is uh, very important. You know, if you, 
if you embed these things in innovation systems, you have to think about the technology, you have to think about the capacities uh -huh. uh, of the local uh, stakeholders, but you also have to think about the policies and the regulatory frameworks uh, to really uh, get to get to scaling. Yes. So the, the NWO projects have done a good job in at least doing the technology and also looking at capacities. Uh, but you know, the third element is still a challenge also. True. You, Rob? Um, well, so I think the great point uh, that was made is it's multinationals, but it's also small companies. It is informal companies. It is also informal sharing, so not necessarily as a company. And when we talk about scaling, then yes, if you scale a certain thing, right, it becomes more dominant. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we need to scale what is uh, successful, but that requires learning. It's not as linear as we think. And um, besides scaling of what we know that works in a specific context, keep the space to experiment and learn and yeah, try out I, new things. I think that's a key thing that you're mentioning. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, please uh, remain seated uh, because we have one more uh, uh, segment to go in this program. Wal, please uh, pay attention to, uh, because the question is, where do we go from here? We've been listening to different views on our food system and how it is affected by crises, but what is your place in the whole? How can one person contribute? So the author of the book, Een Beter Milieu Begint Niet Bij Jezelf, translated into Better Environment Does Not Start With You. Um, the author of that book will wrap up the evening by shining his light on the pressing question of responsibility. What is and what isn't yours as an individual? Uh, he will also touch on the first question I asked uh, to the Zoom wall today, uh, who is the biggest shaker and where can we exert pressure? He uh, is joining us online. Please welcome Jaap Tielbeke. Thank you, everybody. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can, Jaap. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for this uh, very interesting and lively discussion, and I'm honored to try to answer this important question that everybody at home is probably asking themselves right now. What can I do to shake up the food system? It's an, an honorable task, but also a difficult question, but um, let me give it a try. So last summer, I got an invitation to a barbecue with some friends. Are there any carnivores? The host asked. I was happily surprised by this question as it seemed to suggest that vegetarianism has become the norm even if it's only in my bubble of progressive millennials. But one thing is clear, eating meat is not as obvious anymore. You just have to walk into a supermarket or a restaurant to see that vegetarianism is no longer the odd phenomenon it once was. Now, one could argue that this shows the power of consumer activism. It started out with a small minority of environmentally conscious consumers that decided to stop eating animals because it's cruel and bad for the planet. At first, these people were largely frowned upon, but slowly but steadily, they gained support. And now it's rude for a host of a barbecue not to provide plant-based option. And if this trend continues, we will one day frown upon those who insist on eating a steak. Now, from a planetary perspective, this trend is laudable, no doubt about it. But let's not celebrate just yet. Recently, the University of Wageningen published this study that shows meat consumption in the Netherlands has gone up. So despite the growing supply of veggie burgers, we don't seem to be able to reverse the trend that really matters. How come? It might be that the rise in meat consumption is explained by the growing influx of tourism, that these meat craving visitors offset all the noble efforts of the native Dutch. It might, it might also be that people tend to overestimate their own green behavior, that the so-called flexitarians have not cut down their meat consumption as much as they may like to believe. When I arrived at the aforementioned barbecue with friends, it turned out there were still plenty of beef burgers and pork sausages on the grill. We know we need to shake up the food system. If climate science tells us anything, it's that we need a radical transformation of the way we live, travel, produce, and not in the least, the way we farm and eat. A couple of weeks ago, there was this important discussion in the European Parliament. The new president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, 
has made it clear that she is serious about addressing the climate crisis. She wants to push for a Green Deal, an ambitious and comprehensive plan that is not just about wind turbines or solar panels, but also about transportation, housing, and of course, our food system. And the Commission had presented a farm, farm to fork strategy that could make our agricultural practices much more sustainable. Now, this is especially an area where the EU has a lot of influence with over 50 billion euros of the EU budget going to agricultural subsidies each year. But if you follow the news coverage of the debate, you might have gotten the impression that the most important issue on the table was the labeling of meat substitutes. Was the name veggie burger misleading for the consumer because he or she might mistake it, God forbid, for a beef burger? Could people really not tell a Wiener schnitzel apart from a vegan schnitzel? Now, ultimately, this battle was largely lost by the meat lobby. The veggie burger survived, which is good news for the environment, right? Well, yes, but it's also quite trivial compared to the relatively underreported bad news because the complete package of the common agricultural policy that was passed by the European Parliament hardly provided the shakeup of our food system we so drastically need. Farmers will keep receiving financial support without any real sustainability strings attached. And to me, this shows the danger of our obsession with the consumer side of the story. We are talking about veggie burgers, but we should be talking about putting an end to intensive livestock farming. We are shaming each other for hopping on a plane when we should be shaming the politicians who continue to expand airports and subsidize air travel. We are changing our light bulbs while the fossil fuel companies continue to dig for coal. And by focusing on individual behavioral change, we let the true polluters of the hook and ignore the structural causes that lie at the root of this ecological crisis. And to be clear, that is not to say that you and me are powerless as movers and shakers. This is not an excuse to sit back and wait until the politicians or companies solve our problems for us. It is up to us to exert pressure, but we sell ourselves short if we think the best way to do it, to do this is by voting with our shopping carts, so to speak. As consumers, our power may be limited, but as citizens, I believe we can make a difference. It seems like more and more people are starting to realize this. When Shell, uh, you might have seen this, did a Twitter poll last week asking people what they are willing to change to help reduce emissions, it backfired spectacularly. Greta Thunberg, for one, was, and I quote, willing to call out the fossil fuel companies for knowingly destroying the future living conditions for countless generations for profit, and then trying to distract people and prevent real systemic change through endless greenwash campaigns. To which I say, amen. And when I was a child, I internalized the blame. I was told that the only way to save the planet was if we'd all contribute. So as long as I still took long showers or didn't recycle my trash, I was accomplice to the environmental degradation. And thankfully, the kids these days have a different attitude. They not only worry about their own ecological footprint, they take to the streets to hold the people accountable who are actually accountable. And this is something that gives me hope. This younger generation that realizes that shaking up the food system requires more than organizing vegan barbecues. I would argue that this shows the power of real activism. It started out with a small group of children who refused to go to school while the adults in the boardrooms continued to destroy their future. And at first, these kids were largely frowned upon, but slowly but steadily, they gained support. Now, European commissioners are saying that there would not be a Green Deal, green deal if it wasn't for their protests. And if this trend continues, we will one day frown upon those who think that conscious consumerism can save the planet. Because what we really need is conscience citizenship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaap, uh, Jaap Tielbeek. I, I'd like to just, out of my personal uh, experience, run something by you, Jaap. I'm a, I've been a vegetarian for, for, what is it, 15 years now. And the one thing that irritates me is that we are always talking about meat substitutes, whereas I, as a true vegetarian, am looking for 
vegetable um, means of getting my proteins. It has nothing to do with meat. So that's that's just a way of looking at it differently. How how would you address that? See, I don't know where I stand on that because I have a lot of respect for people like you who have become a vegetarian while uh, the only thing you could find in the supermarket basically as a meat substitute was uh, uh, this tofu blocks. Um, I only recently or for a couple of years now become vegetarian and to me it's actually helpful that there are um, you know plant-based burgers or meat substitutes and I but think that's, that's that, is, easy, that yeah. is the same for a lot of people. So mm. I think, yes, we do need to change the way we think about our diets. But if you know veggie burgers or, or, or so-called meat uh, analogs can help us reach a more sustainable uh, food system, I'm all for that. Yeah, well, I, I understand what you're saying. It's, it's a way of getting people to, to, uh, to do the right thing. But I think I think the more sustainable way of, of looking at vegetarianism is to just change your mindset about what it is you're eating. But that was just one to tease you. Thank you so very much, Jaap Dielbeke. And um, that's that's unfortunately all we have time for today. I, I would like to thank my two panelists and, of course, the panelists we had earlier today. Um, all the participants in the Zoom wall, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much for giving us that global perspective here today. Uh, saying goodbye to Julius and Richard and to Flora and to Charity and Francesco. Thank you so very much. We hope to to join you again some other day. Um, of course, thank you very much to NWO Wotro for organizing this event and to the Bali. Great location, great crew. It was wonderful talking about this. I think that was the first step in talking about our food system. Don't you agree? Yeah. We will certainly be doing uh, following up steps. A more, lot more needed. So thank you very much. And um, keep thinking about food and how you treat it. Talk to you another time.